Welcome to the guided poster tour on adolescence and HIV. Um, I'm very happy to have you here and uh, know that we have five really outstanding posters that we want to talk about. So um, maybe what we can do is go to the first one, uh, which is change in sexual behavior and partner communication following oral HIV self-testing among adolescents and young adults in Kenya. And we have uh, Matthew Driver, who is um, here to present this poster for us. So Matthew, um, do you want to we can do several things. If you want to have us look at the little video presentation that you did, we could do that. Or if you want, you can just tell us a little bit about the work that you did with this with this uh, um, uh, communication tool. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Pat. And thank you to the team and the opportunity to be here. So I'm Kate Wilson presenting on behalf of Matthew Driver, who is my master's student. I am the principal investigator of this study. <clears throat> and actually, I would like to ask if you could just show uh, the poster so that we can follow along. Okay. Yes. And so this is a secondary analysis that we conducted as part of a cohort study that we have recently completed. And this was called the Youth Engaged Self-Testing Study which we conducted in Nairobi, Kenya. And the goal of the study was to evaluate a new strategy for offering community-based oral self-testing to young people. And in Kenya, young people are a priority population to receive testing and get linked to care or prevention. They have lower testing rates than adults. And by 2017, the Kenyan government had integrated oral self-testing into its national guidelines, but really we're wondering how best to operationalize those guidelines. And we had some earlier evidence that a community-based approach could reach more adolescents. And um, we could get some important information on whether they would accept the test, and as well as some of their um, behavioral characteristics. So Matt analyzed the behavioral surveys that we collected at enrollment and its follow-up to look at the question of whether receiving the oral, the oral self-test uh, within this study would influence their conversations with their sexual partners uh, or their sexual behavior. And how we did this is, well, we had um, 274 adolescents enrolled in the study who we followed for four months. And all 274 of them ended up accepting the self-test. And among those, we restricted this sample to those who reported any sexual activity during the study. And then we looked at their enrollment survey, sexual behavior characteristics, and then their follow-up survey, sexual behavior characteristics. And what you can see, um, I can just dive in and go through the poster now. Okay. Um, so here we go. So I've gone through the background and methods. And I should say that this, this study was conducted in partnership with a, a community organization and we use peer mobilizers from the community to uh, recruit participants. And we enrolled them from three in three distinct uh, venues, three distinct channels, bars and restaurants, which are we call hotspots, pharmacies and home-based testing with the hypothesis that we would actually reach uh, adolescents with different characteristics and risk behaviors. And so, if oh great, I can use the toolbar, thank you. So of the 274 adolescents in the study, we included 224 in our sample, um, all of whom I said had completed a self-test uh, but also had reported sexual activity. And in this sample, as you can see in table one, um, most of them were female, 64, about 64% 64 were female and older adolescents ages um, 18 to 24 and had previously tested for HIV. They're not using a self-test. And they reported um, risk behaviors, including exposure to violence. 
Now, tables two and three actually address our primary questions. So from table two overall, we see that there was a change from baseline that uh, there was a greater proportion of participants reported talking to their partners about HIV testing uh, after they took the self-test and it month four follow-up. However, we found an overall lower prevalence of consistent condom use. And we looked at condom use by partner type and found that this was lower among casual partners. We also found um, that this lower prevalence in consistent condom use with casual partners was primarily among females. And when you, um, if you go to table three and you look at, uh, we have, we have the results stratified by gender and in the bold, that's where you see those results. And interestingly, our other measure of condom use, which was unprotected condomless sex in the last 30 days, we didn't see a change in that measure in any group before and after self-testing. Uh, we also didn't see a change in self-reported risk behavior. So the main change was the decrease was the increase in partner communication about self-testing and using condoms, but a decrease among young women with their casual partners in, in consistent condom use, meaning always using a condom versus sometimes or never. So those results were interesting and somewhat unexpected, and they lead to some next steps. So the decline that we observed, and I'm just scrolling down to the bottom of, with our summary and conclusions. So what we saw that in this study with offering oral self-testing resulted in a higher proportion of adolescents reporting they were talking to their partners about testing. There was a decline in consistent condom use with casual partners, though not with main partners. And this was observed among young women. So this leads us to, this may suggest that having a negative self-test result could result in lower motivation uh, to use condoms with a casual partner, uh, or conversely, greater motivation to not worry about having to use condoms. Um, at this, in addition, it could suggest that these these females who were working, who were um, engaged in sex with casual partners, were primarily from bars and nightclubs, in which they are also engaged in transactional sex. So another factor that could be at play is that young women, when they know that they are HIV negative by the self-test may, and are already having difficulty negotiating condoms with casual partners, and there can be financial incentives for having condomless sex, may feel somewhat motivated or pressured to go ahead and have unprotected sex. And that's where I think it highlights some complexities in young people's decision-making around um, condom use that worth that are worth exploring more in qualitative work, and we actually have a qualitative uh, study that we're presenting at this conference that should shed light on some of these factors. So I think limitations of this are we don't have a comparison group to see how consistent condom use may change in absence of self testing, and these measures were all by self report, so there is some uh, potential social desirability bias. And it speaks to the importance of considering integrated client-centered counseling support um, and partner communication strategies with self-testing in the future. Great work, Kate. And also out to Matthew for uh, leading this project. Um, so I didn't quite understand you when you were talking about the venue in females being the hotspots, the bars and the nightclub. Are you saying you were speculating that, or did you really see more of a difference in that venue from the compared to the other venues, or have you been able to analyze that? Oh, that that's a great point, and and um, I apologize because uh, we've done another analyses by another other analyses by venue where I do know that sexual behavior varies by by venue. Um, mm -hmm. you now here we just looked at it by gender. Um, and Matt did prepare another table, which I don't have handy, that did look, that looked at um, condom use by um, venue. And we do see that it's localized, that you're gonna see the higher proportion of overall sexual activity, condomless sex, and the, 
the youth in those venues are the ones that also have more casual partners than mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. other venues. So it all kind of, it points to that. And in our qualitative study, we were finding a couple interesting points in that we did focus groups discussions with youth recruited by venue. And those from the hotspots were saying, you know, it knowing that I am HIV negative helps me better negotiate and use condoms with clients. But at the same time, it depends, you know, our level of trust and other youth were saying, well, we're also so spontaneous that we may get tested once we're negative. We feel like it's OK, gives us permission to have condomless sex. So both of these factors are at play and um, that we may be seeing in the quantitative data. Very interesting. Um, so uh, did you ask, particularly among the young males, about sexual preference? Were these predominantly heterosexual males? Or did you have some men who have sex with men? Or was that part of the data that you collected? And did you see any difference based on sexual preference in the male population, if you have that data? That's a great question. So we, we did ask questions indirectly on sexual identity. And that's mm -hmm. because this is asking these questions, it's still pretty stigmatized in our young population. About 15 to 20% uh, predominantly in the hotspot channel reported that the that they tended to have sex with other young men. Uh, however, we didn't have sufficient numbers to stratify um, by sexual identity. Gotcha. Um, so I would love to hear what others think about this. And um, you know, I think that, you know, the whole concept of self-testing in itself is is uh, an interesting concept. And, uh, you know, I think something altruistic adults like us like to protect all those adolescents, but we see what an important thing it is. Yes. So uh, I'm going to open it up to our other participants to see if they have questions for you, Kate. And, um, you know, if there's anything that uh, they'd like to know more about the the data. I think y'all are live, but if not, if you could put it in the chat box, we can bring it up there. Great, I welcome any questions. Thank you, Pat. Florence was asking, how did you recruit the males? We recruited the males and females. So we had peer mobilizers from the community that were mixed. There was young men and women that actually had worked at, um, they had worked in all of these channels before doing home-based testing or passing through pharmacies or working in the bars and nightclubs. And so that's how they did it. And um, we weren't purposefully trying to select more, you know, we weren't purposefully selecting by gender, um, we were just attempting to reach, it was more by age groups so 15 to 24. And basically just talking to them and seeing if they were interested in hearing more about a study and, and then following up from there. You certainly named the hot spots appropriately. <laughs> Apologies for the loud noise outside my house. Um, <laughs> can you repeat the question? I was just saying that you appropriately named the hotspots. Yeah, that's a local term. And here's a picture. So our, and in fact, the hotspot participants were recruited at night because that's when most people were um, at the bars and, and doing business. And in fact, we rent, rented out a room uh, at the hotspots for our study activities, for their client privacy and uh, study staff privacy and safety. Good. Other um, questions? Thank you very much, Kate. I'm not seeing any other questions. Maybe we could move Thank on you. to the second one. And um, Leah Lawrence, who was supposed to present this, is not going to be able to be with us. But her colleague, Amy Scheel, is here. So um, Amy, if you want to uh, come in and tell us about high rates of primary and secondary syphilis infections in HIV positive adolescents and young adult men who have sex with men in Atlanta. Oh. All right, Pat, thank you very much. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. Leah sends her regards and wishes that she could be here with everyone today. 
Um, I don't know if it's an option. I know you mentioned previously to share the video. I know that she made a video and she'd probably be the best person, um, you know, to talk about this. But if not, I'm happy to just go through the poster with everyone as well. Okay. Riki, is that possible or did I falsely bill it? Up, oh, they don't have the video. Sorry. Okay. That's totally <laughs> fine. Um, so My bad. Yep, that's really fine. Um, so as Pat mentioned, I'm just gonna be discussing um, our study, the high rates of primary and secondary syphilis infections in HIV positive adolescents and young um, adult men who have sex with men in Atlanta. And um, so just a little bit of our background, um, the rates of primary and secondary syphilis have continued to increase in the US, especially amongst men who have sex with men and, and particularly in Atlanta and in Georgia, we're one of the top five states in the US in terms of our um, syphilis rates and rates of infection. Um, and nearly half of syphilis infections in MSM occur in HIV positive individuals. Um, and we know that you know both HIV and syphilis together has been associated with lower CD4 counts um, and higher HIV viral loads, thus increasing the risk of HIV transmission. Um, so methods, this was part of a larger retrospective chart review, um, looking at individuals who are presenting to the Grady Ponce Clinic uh, in Atlanta, Georgia from 2009 uh, to 2018, um, and we included anyone who was HIV infected, sexually active in between the ages of 13 and 24, um, and were having sex with men. Um, so syphilis infection, uh, the general uh, definitions for syphilis, so we looked at a positive RPR and a positive treponemal antibody, um, and then defined resolution of infection as a fourfold drop in RPR. We also looked at, so we looked at initial syphilis infection as well as reinfection, uh, which we defined as a fourfold increase in RPI, uh, RPR or a twofold increase in RPR with really high clinical suspicion that was documented uh, in their chart and treated by the provider. Uh, we then looked at the first STI incidence rates and then incidence of reinfection. Um, so for results, we enrolled 366 MSM uh, with an age at first observation, meaning that this is the first time that they uh, were included in our study, whether that's the first time they um, arrived to clinic, the day they were diagnosed with HIV, um, or that was the first time that the study they met study period criteria. Uh, the majority of our participants were African American um, and horizontally infected, um, and then the majority uh, re uh, referred to themselves as homosexual. And you can see that uh, many of them reported inconsistent condom use at around 60%. Um, so for the results, we had 55% of our participants that had at least one syphilis infection, um, and our first syphilis, syphilis incidence rate was 25.8 per 100 person years, and then our syphilis reinfection incidence rate was 36.4 um, per 100 person years, which are both, you know, staggeringly very high um, considering um, just the general national rates. Um, so, you know, in conclusion, uh, HIV infected adolescent and young adult MSM in Atlanta have disproportionately high first and recurrent incidence rates of primary and secondary syphilis. And we know that missed or untreated syphilis may lead to serious long-term health complications, especially in immunocompromised individuals and increased HIV transmission. Um, and I know just, you know, through this clinic and working with a lot of these patients, we're seeing, you know, um, higher rates of you know, neurosyphilis and things like that. So the complications can de definitely be um, very staggering. Um, and then despite national recommendations, screening for co-STIs, including syphilis, which I'll be talking about a little later on today, um, remains suboptimal in HIV positive MSM in primary care settings. Um, and we need to do, you know, do a better job of increasing adherence to routine screening um, and making sure that we're able um, to treat these infections. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, if folks could put some comments or some questions into the chat box, I'm going to um, just start off by asking, um, first off, a disclosure. I'm from Memphis, and Memphis and Baltimore are like have been neck and neck fighting each other for the highest syphilis rates in the U.S. for a number of years. So um, this is not an unusual surprise because it reflects very much what we see in our clinic. Um, I did have a question though, for the participants in the study, you included both those that were established clinic patients, as well as ones who were newly referred to the clinic. Is, is that an accurate statement? 
Yeah, so essentially anyone who was in care uh, between our study period time and met age criteria was included Mm -hmm. in the study. Yeah, it's even more demoralizing to think that, you know, because I'm sure much like um, what we do on a typical clinic visit is the same thing you do, but it always includes, uh, you know, education about safer sexual practices. And, you you know, these kind of almost look like failures of our teaching of, of individuals who, who um, have recurrent syphilis. Do you have any idea between the incident patients, new patients coming in versus return patient, how the population was distributed? Um, I do not. I'm sorry. I'm sure Leah would probably have a little better idea. She spent a little bit more time with this data. Yeah. Um, that would make me feel better if I knew it was people coming in. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> Yeah, this is a, a, a big issue, um, I think, in, in all of our clinics in the U.S., and I would imagine internationally as well. Um, what are some, some uh, thoughts about high rates of syphilis in this population from um, across the world? What, what do you see in Kenya and, and other areas of the, of the world? Any thoughts there? What about response to treatment? Were there any issues with that? I think the majority of our patients, you know, once they were diagnosed, you can see, um, you know, this box here, treatment received that over 90% of our patients received treatment. Um, And most of them, you know, I'd have to go back. We'd have to do a secondary analysis about Mm -hmm. the numbers, you know, who had long-standing infections and long-term consequences of uh, syphilis, but I think the majority of the outcomes were pretty good, just on a subjective okay. level. Okay. And Kate or Florence, were you going to add a comment? Um, yes, I was just going to say um, that um, our prevalence wasn't... I, I think, think I Florence have... is speaking. Yeah. But your, your volume is really low, Florence. Can you speak up? Okay. So I was just going to say that uh, the, the, the current available data uh, suggests, uh, I, I think, rates of about uh, 2 to 3 percent population-wide. But I haven't seen data specifically for the age group 15 to 24. Yeah. As opposed to 50 percent? <laughs> yes, as opposed wow. to 50 Kate, did you have a comment or? Right, so we don't, in in my work, we don't measure STIs directly, though I know there are groups um, with Connie Kellum and Jared Baden in the University of Washington that have been evaluating STIs among adolescent girls and young women um, in South Africa and elsewhere and finding very high, is part of their PrEP implementation studies and finding Mm -hmm. 15 to 30% prevalence of STIs. Yeah, I think Amy will show us a little bit later. We see um, we see most of um, our syphilis in our young men who have sex with men, um, and very little of it in our females that that we follow. But you know, again, kind of different uh, demographic groups. Yeah. Florence also wanted to ask: Are the high risk uh, young men or just general population men? Yeah, I mean, you can think of high risk if these are, you know, MSM individuals who have HIV. Um, So I think in general, I would consider them high risk, but um, we didn't break down in terms of there are, I would say, less than 10% had had a history of sex work, but we're not looking specifically at, you know, a group of individuals who, um, you know, define themselves as sex workers. Other thoughts or comments? Thank you, Amy. We'll hear from you in just a few more minutes. Okay, oh, thank Florence, you. Is, Florence is typing. I think that may be behind. Florence was asking, what are your next steps? Education does not work. (laughs) 
Um, I mean, so in terms of next steps, you know, if education doesn't work, I know there, uh, Leah, who is, uh, you know, primary on this study, uh, was recently funded for a study uh, for a condom campaign um, among youths. And I know um, is work, you know, has been kind of affected by COVID and getting that rolled out and, you know, working with other um, young individuals, but they're having, um, you know, HIV infected MSM like champions at the Pons Clinic to kind of, you know, do peer to peer teaching um, and condom campaigns. So um, we'll see if that has any effect. And um, I know in the past, you know, history would say that that's not always the, the best way, but we're just trying to do some education and see, um, you know, how we can try to, you know, de decrease that number. Yeah, and I think frequent testing and, and uh, treatment is, is also uh, really key. Okay, um, thank you again, Amy. Our next one is Florence Mwanga, who will tell us about overlapping significant life events are associated with HIV viral non-suppression among youth in clinics in rural East Africa. So welcome, Florence. Thank we'll you. Wait and get your abstract up. Yes. Or your poster, sorry. There we go. So, um, okay. can I enlarge it? Okay, let me see. If... Oh, there they go. Yes. Okay. So, uh, so yes, uh, I'm presenting. Uh, um, it's, a, it's a long title. Overlapping significant life events associated with virulent suppression in in youth in rural East Africa. Um, so uh, the, the youths that, that we looked at were part of a, 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 a randomized a cluster randomized trial uh, that's looking at a variety of ways to improve care for youth. So we just looked at uh, at, the, at at their baseline data cross section cross sectionally. So uh, youth living with HIV in Africa have poor HIV cascade outcomes. Uh, they're less likely to test for HIV or start treatment or stay on treatment. And therefore they are often viremic compared to, to adults. <clears throat> it's thought that um, uh, because the period of about uh, 15 to 24 years, uh, which is usually referred to as a youth, that period is a period of massive physical and uh, cognitive and neurodevelopment. Those changes um, have a way they interact with uh, life events uh, that happen during that period to, 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 to modulate uh, um, uh, in care engagement in HIV facilities. Um, however, uh, it, data on the prevalence of such life events and and among youth in rural Africa, and how these life events are associated with virus suppression is limited. So we set out to try and, uh, uh, and find out uh, the prevalence of these life events among this, this, group, this group of youth that were enrolled in, a, in this cluster randomized trial, and how, and how, they, and how the life events affect um, virus suppression. So um, at baseline, we had we had uh, we had enrolled 900 youth ages 15 to 24 between February and October 2019, and they had been recruited from 14 HIV clinics in rural southwest Uganda and southwest Kenya uh, as part of the Search Youth Clinical Trial. Uh, we conducted uh, cross-sectional analysis. Uh, at the at baseline of the study, at baseline, and and uh, 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 we conducted this uh, cross section analysis of data we had collected um, uh, using a care planning tool that that we used to list potential barriers to care, and these were the life events that I talked about earlier, which included uh, items like start, stop, school, or employment change in residence, divorce, separation or relationship strife, uh, having a new sexual partner, death within the family, uh, having a recent sickness or hospitalization, incarceration, family strife, and birth or pregnancy. We also looked at behaviors like any alcohol use and any HIV status disclosure. 
uh, we, so we conducted multivariate logistics regression, uh, adjusting for clinic clustering and to identify this potential, the association of these potential barriers with uh, viral suppression. And our viral suppression was, um, was determined as less than 40 copies or a good viral, biological response two weeks after starting ART among those patients that would not have qualified for suppressed viral load at this slide. So um, uh, our results, yes, so um, like, like the first study from Kenya, um, our participants were mostly female uh, and, uh, and the females in the study were slightly older than the males overall. Most participants had already started antiretroviral therapy, uh, which was like nearly two thirds had already started antiretroviral therapy uh, when we enrolled them into the study. About 17% of the participants reported some alcohol use and, um, and about 81% uh, of the participants reported that they're disclosed to at least a family member and 54% reported that they had disclosed their status to a partner. Uh, these two categories are not mutually exclusive. Someone could have disclosed to both a family member and a partner at the time. Um, so the, the most commonly reported life events uh, were in descending order were pregnancy or birth, which was at 16%, and a change in residence, uh, which we also called mobility or movement, they at also at 16%. And then sickness, start or stop school or employment at 9%. And at 8%, we had family death, relationship strife, divorce, separation, or a new sexual partner. Uh, it, it was common for participants to report two or more overlapping life events, uh, with 17% reporting two or more and about 5% reporting three or more overlapping life events. I need to scroll down a little bit more. No, on the, let's go this side, this side on the, okay, yeah, there we go. So um, we, right side, yes. Yes, so we found that uh, we found that uh, significant, uh, we found significant and independent associations with the lower odds of viral suppression when participants reported two or more overlapping life, life events. Also, uh, and, that, and the odds were about 0 0.52 and they were very significant. We also found that those who used alcohol were half as likely to be suppressed compared to, to to those who did not use alcohol. Increasing age also uh, was very, was, was significant. Um, uh, the, 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 older, the, older, the older youth were more likely to be suppressed than the younger ones. Disclosure to family status, had, uh, those who had disclosed their, to their family, their HIV status had two times the odds of being suppressed. And that was also very significant as was those who had disclosed their status to partners, which was also nearly two times the odds of being suppressed. So we concluded that uh, overlapping significant recent life events like alcohol use, uh, I mean, uh, life events like um, pregnancy, childbirth, and behaviors like alcohol use or a lack of disclosure uh, associated with viral and suppression. And we recommend that uh, syst systematically and routinely assessing for such events and behaviors could allow providers and patients to identify and address potential barriers to treatment with the goal of improving clinical care outcomes in this vulnerable population. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florence. Um, Others can uh, join in and ask questions or type questions in the chat box. Um, I just had a, uh, a couple of questions, Florence. Were these um, uh, 
participants uh, perinatally infected or were these mostly behaviorally infected or was it a mixed group? It's a mixed, we have a mixed group. We have a mixed okay. group. Because we enrolled you know? uh, anyone in that age group that was on ART or was starting care or could be found and re-engaged re if they had left care. Mm -hmm. Do you have an estimate of how they were broken down between perinatal and behaviorally acquired? No, not off my head. Okay. I, think I, do, I do have for the boys. I think for the for the males, we had more than 60% perinatally acquired, but for the girls, no, don't have it. Okay. And, and then my other question is um, sort of the inclusion of life events and alcohol, um, which almost seem like, you know, they could be interrelated to each other, um, you know, all of the, the life events and particularly having many of the life events may affect alcohol usage. Did you explore in your data any deeper to see whether or not there was an association between those two themselves rather than the adherence only? Uh, no, I think that's a good idea to look at, to, to, to explore actually the alcohol okay. and then the life events. No, we had not. Okay. Yes. Other thoughts or questions folks have for Florence? Really interesting work, and I think it 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 um, sort of brings home again the point of no matter how much you know we try to encourage and educate and and teach around adherence, um, there's so many factors that we just really can't control that play into uh, youth's decisions about being able to take their medication. So, yeah. Amy, did you have a thought or? Uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you, Florence, so much for sharing. And just had a question. So I lived in Gulu and Kampala for three years, so you know, have some experience in Uganda. Um, I was just wondering how you guys defined relationship strife, um, and you know, other questions about did you feel like participants were really, really willing to be honest about a lot of these life events? Because I know sometimes, um, especially like in the village setting, things like alcohol and divorce can be very taboo. Yeah, you're, you're right. So yeah, we 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 think that uh, when we do uh, later analysis, we might find like a few things like alcohol use might be a little higher than the percentage we see here because they were, this was their first time interacting with our clinicians because these were not their regular clinicians taking making taking these interviews. It was their first time interacting with our clinicians and being the, the particular age group with trust issues. We, we think we might find a little bit more, and this might just be uh, for those who are comfortable to say. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Other questions? Thank you, Florence. That was really great work. We look forward to hearing some more about this project. Um, and our next one is Amy Churi, who will talk to us about qualitative analysis of a mobile WhatsApp group messaging intervention for adolescents living with HIV in Kenya. So Hi, Ashley. thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's okay. Can we, thank you so much, Jen. Thank you for this opportunity. Great, we have the abstract up. Um, yeah, so I'm here to present on a project um, entitled Qualitative Analysis of a Mobile WhatsApp Group Messaging Intervention for Adolescents Living with HIV in Kenya. Um, we know that um, there is an increasing amount of mobile phone usage in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we're starting to believe that um, this, this fact might provide opportunities for interventions that could be delivered um, through the cell phone. So the objective of this study was to develop and implement a three-month WhatsApp, WhatsApp chat intervention to provide peer support for adolescents living with HIV in, in Kenya. Um, the data that I'm going to present now comes from the qualitative analysis of the content of the actual support groups that were implemented through this platform. Uh, so the study was implemented at the uh, academic model providing access to healthcare, otherwise known as the AMPATH Consortium which is a large HIV treatment program that cares for over 15,000 children and adolescents living with HIV across 800 clinical sites. 
Um, all participants enrolled in this study were given a cell phone with the WhatsApp chat platform um, downloaded and, and installed, and they were given a pseudonym uh, in order to main their, maintain their own confidentiality. There were two groups created, one for adolescents between the ages of nine and 14 years, and the other group was for adolescents between the ages of 15 and 19 years. Um, a trained counselor moderated the, the groups and led weekly education sessions on a list of, of critical topics for this group, including um, stress management, drug and alcohol use, intimate partner relationship, ART adherence, and also disclosure. Um, the chats in the WhatsApp platform remained open at all times for the three month period so that um, the participants could engage with each other at all times and then could also engage with the moderator um, you know, as, as appropriate and as needed. Um, so the majority, we enrolled 30 participants. Um, the majority, could you scroll, scroll up for me? Yeah, great. So we enrolled 30 participants, the majority of which were female um, with an average age of about 16 years. The participants were required to be engaged in, in HIV care in order to be eligible for the study. Um, so qualitative analysis of the, the peer support transcripts uh, revealed critical information on HIV literacy, medication taking literacy, um, experiences that the that the adolescents have in the school setting, and also the dynamics of intimate relationships. Um, so participants had high HIV literacy with a very strong interest in learning more information about their HIV infection. They were constantly asking the, the moderator for more information um, and were also asking each other, um, you know, details about their infection. Uh, the participants also had a really high medication taking literacy despite extensive conver uh, conversations around barriers to maintaining their adherence. So they were asking questions about their about how to maintain ART adherence, were discussing um, barriers that they were experiencing in various settings and sort of like bouncing ideas off of each other about how, you know, what sort of approaches they use to maintain adherence. Um, the experiences in the school setting was uh, a very important topic for the adolescents. Um, the participants discussed significant HIV-related stigma in the school setting um, and talked a lot about, in, in combination with the medication-taking literacy section, how to, maintain, how to maintain adherence in the school setting where they're experiencing high rates of stigma. And so here they they, they sort of came together to give each other advice on how to navigate, you know, um, stigmatizing behavior, both from their teachers and also from other students, how to make sure that they don't miss their medications, even when they don't really have um, anywhere to privately take them. And then the last um, major finding of this, of this analysis um, were the dynamics of their various relationships. And so discussions among the participants ranged um, from, you know, uh, classmate relationships to intimate partner relationships to how to navigate um, a parent who maybe doesn't know of their HIV status, how to navigate teachers, um, how to disclose their HIV status to, to intimate partners. And so they sought a lot of information from each other and also from the moderator about how to navigate these sorts of relationships. We concluded uh, from this study that um, we found the mobile WhatsApp chat platform a really valuable um, platform to use for providing peer support and even to provide education potentially. Um, that was not the original aim of the study, but that's something that we found um, through this analysis. Um, the, the platform allows an opportunity for the adolescents to share experiences, um, to discuss their fears and sort of get answers to their questions. Uh, in a way that's confidential and private and um, takes away some of the fear of, of potential um, accidental disclosure or vengeful disclosure for that matter. Um, we found that there is, an, there is a need for education on HIV topics and mental health support for adolescents living with HIV. This was a cohort of perinatally infected adolescents um, 
And so we found that that's a, a critical part of this, that they need to continue to learn after they learn of their infection. Um, and we also found that there is a critical need for interventions uh, for stigma mitigation across the board, but particularly in the school setting, as you know, we the participants disclosed quite a bit of um, challenges in this in this setting. Thank you, Ashley. Very, very interesting. I'm not a WhatsApp uh, pro, so mm -hmm. um, I guess you know one of the questions I have is. Um, you know, what were y'all anticipating as far as frequency of utilization and how did the study compare to what you thought? Did, did you use it as much as you thought, more than you thought, or about what, what you had predicted? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, this was a three-month intervention with weekly moderated discussions based on education and, and other related topics. Um, and so we sort of knew that that was what we were going to do. And we thought for sure that the you know participants would engage in that um, one time a week sort of frequency. But what I should say is we had um, this analysis is based on uh, like 600 pages of transcripts, like Word document. And that was quite a bit more than I, I think we had sort of um, anticipated, which is fantastic. It means that they were really engaging. Um, and in the analysis, quite a bit of the conversations um, were participant led versus the, the moderator led. So they were engaging on their own outside of that one week uh one time per week time frame. Yeah, that sort of gets to the next question is that, you know, this is set up so you have kind of a, uh, a pseudonym to, to be on the site and to contribute. Um, from looking at the transcripts of what you all had, can you tell whether or not there were sort of um, either break off groups or individuals that, um, you know, became kind of met in person or, or anything like that? We didn't measure that. Um, all mm -hmm. of the participants came from one clinic site and they there was a like one day um, event for enrollment and that sort so, of thing. So they may we didn't have, known have each other. Potentially, but the, the mm -hmm. point was for it to be confidential. And so right. we didn't actually we didn't look at that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as far as have you been able to go back and, and get any sort of feedback from the participants about their acceptability and what they thought of it? Or is that coming soon? Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, that was the first part. Um, so we have a paper under review that's talking about this acceptability and feasibility. And that was a, a quantitative study mm -hmm. with pre and post inter, inter, interviews from the participants. Um, and what we found was that the, the actual impl implementation was very acceptable to them. They really liked being able to um, like just sort of like text whenever they wanted to. And what we found was most of these participants didn't actually know any other adolescents living with HIV, despite the likelihood that, yep. that they may have known. Um, the one sort of barrier that we found um, was that buy-in from the parents was was a could have could have been a challenge in some ways. So what we found was that some of the parents, you know, understandably wanted them to to uh, focus on their homework and sort of like engage in other more you know, arguably more important things, you know, like more adolescent friendly homework and school and that sort of thing. And so some of the participants took, I mean, some of the participants' parents took the phones at periods of time. And so that was our major barrier to to actual feasibility. But, um, but yeah, otherwise we were very successful. Universal concerns, homework, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Adolescent concerns, yep. Yes. Other thoughts, questions for Ashley about this important work? Can I just I, uh, ask a question about the, the, the I, I find this very interesting and we have a, a, something similar in our intervention that uh, our WhatsApp um, collaborative for the health workers for difficult cases. So I wanted to find out what the mentors themselves thought, the, mod the people who moderated the groups, and if they found this a useful way to get the, the adolescent, uh, to help the adolescent, or did they need to even make phone calls and visits? 
I'm sorry, I ha I'm having a little bit of a hard time. You you asked who who was the moderator, and then what was the second question? Yes. How did the mod did the moderators also find this uh, the, 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 this kind of discussion? Uh, uh, WhatsApp based discussion and and sharing problems and solving them by WhatsApp. Did they find it useful? Did they think they were being impactful? That's a great question. Yeah, so the we had one moderator for, for both of the groups and that person um, was very intimately connected to the clinic system. And so they worked a lot with, um, you know, the various clinic workers. Um, and so they sort of, served as the in-between person. So if there was a problem that needed additional um, support, the moderator, you know, had a, a sort of script to go through for certain for certain issues. And then it, if needed, they were connected through um, through that channel. So, yeah, I mean, the overall, both the, the clinic support side and also the participants in, like thought that this was a, an appropriate um, and feasible uh, way of sort of guiding questions and figuring out challenges for this group. Thank you. Any other questions for Ashley? Thank you so much and good luck with uh, future work. Thank you. We'll, we'll move to our last um, poster now, which is by Amy again. Um, high prevalence of asymptomatic sexually transmitted infections at baseline clinic visit following HIV diagnosis in Atlanta youth. Okay, thank hey. you very much again, Pat, um, and thank you for everyone giving me the second opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, for those of you who are just joining us, I'm Amy. I'm a third year medical student at Emory. I'm going to be talking about um, part of a larger retrospective study, basically the high number of STIs that we found at baseline visit for individuals who are coming to um, the Ponce Clinic in Atlanta uh, for their initial HIV um, enrollment visit. Um, so we know that the IDSA primary care guidelines recommend screening for co-STIs uh, for all HIV positive men who have sex with men and transgender women who present for initial care. Um, and we also know the CDC additionally recommends, you know, three site testing, um, urogenital, rectal, and oropharyngeal. Um, obviously, when, you know, COVID isn't interrupting the, you know, availability of swabs and things like that, we know that that's kind of the gold standard that's recommended. Um, but what I alluded to before in the previous presentation is that we know screening for co-STIs in this popula population remains suboptimal. Um, and we really need to kind of intensify screening uh, because we know that uh, HIV with additional infections kind of increases um, HIV transmission and viral load. Uh, so for this study, we aim to determine the number of HIV positive uh, adolescents and young adults who presented with co-STIs at any anatomic site during their original visit. Um, anyone who was enrolled between 2009 and 2018 who was presenting to the clinic for enrollment within three months of their diagnosis. So a lot of the patients that are coming to this clinic will, you know, attend, um, you know, rapid testing sites outside of bars and different events at Atlanta. So this was really when they were coming to establish care with the provider, um, as long as they did that within three months. Um, we collected data on all co-STIs during their enrollment, um, including the diagnoses and resolution dates, the sites of their infections, their clinical symptoms, their reported sexual practices, and then um, if they received treatment, um, included, uh, you know, the typical things we think of, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, herpes, HPV, and LGV, um, and then did analyses to look at the number, type, and sites of um, STI infections. Um, so we enrolled 237 individuals who had a mean age of HIV diagnosis of 20. Um, the majority were male, 95%, uh, um, and then 91% um, African-American. Um, so in this study, we in, uh, diagnosed 149 infections amongst 101 individuals. So a little over 40% of those being enrolled um, had a, you know, co-infection, um, uh, including, you know, their HIV. So we had 26% of participants had one STI, 12% had two STIs, and then 3.4 had three or more STIs. Um, so you can see in figure one um, on the bottom left there that HPV was the most common 
um, STI that we diagnosed, and we're currently working on a study to kind of tease that out more. I think there's not much data about anal HPV and, you know, the longitudinal outcomes of that. So we're currently looking at that right now. Um, but that was the most common. And then syphilis, which I alluded to before. Um, and then you can see gonor followed by gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, I think importantly, you can see in figure two, the anatomical sites of gonorrhea and chlamydia infections. So rectal was the most common for both, um, followed by urogenital and oropharyngeal. Um, and something that our group is kind of working on right now is to look at uh, patient, you know, reports of the type of sexual practices they have and then the types of infections they have. Um, so we know a lot of patients, I think roughly 40% in our analysis right now is saying that, you know, patients will report that they are only the insertive partner and they have, you know, rectal gonorrhea or chlamydia. Um, so we're lo looking at that, but that just goes back to, you know, why the CDC is recommending the three site testing. Um, and then importantly, in this population, um, there's a really high rate of asymptomatic infections um, with 70% of the syphilis infections and then 60% of chlamydia and 50% of gonorrhea infections having no subjective or objective signs of infection. Um, so kind of in summary, the high prevalence of STIs in this population and, uh, highlights the importance of the current guidelines. Um, and really just the importance of baseline screening for all STIs when someone is presenting uh, for initial enrollment. Um, and we also found that the majority of co-STIs at baseline are asymptomatic, really emphasizing that need for three-site anatomical testing. Um, and we think enrollment visits highlight a unique opportunity for invention, uh, intervention, just going over you know, their full healthcare plan and kind of where they go from here and being able to lay out why this is important and why they need to you know, stay on top of it. Um, and then hopefully we'll continue to do some work, especially in Atlanta, um, to kind of increase co-infection uh, co uh, testing uh, and be able to treat these. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Again, um, echoes what I see on a daily day-to-day day -day basis. <laughs> so, thoughts or questions? This one pretty much speaks for itself, but I'll put another plug in for three site testing, how important it is. How um, you mentioned something about swab availability. How did that uh, impact clinic operations when COVID came along? Was it uh, you know, a significant issue or did you just triage all the swabs to do COVID testing or how did that work? Yeah, I can say from my experience now, um, you know, not so much at IDP particularly. I think, no, there might be some people on this call who are specifically at IDP, but just at Grady in general too, that the availability of swabs right now is very low. Um, and I know that, you know, urine detection is pretty much off, you know, the table right now. Um, and they're really saving swabs for very high risk, you know, new sexual partners or symptomatic patients, but mm -hmm. essentially uh, probably estimated to run out um, at the end of this month, and then, you know, really just trying to triage those to the most high-risk patients, um, and then kind of provider dependent on if they're going to treat empirically and that kind of thing. Amazing the things you can run out of that you thought were so plentiful. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Um, please type them in the chat box. I want to really thank the um, speakers for your work. Um, I think we're all here because we're interested in HIV in adolescents and youth, and uh, we recognize what a complex uh, population they are to take care of. We've gotten to see a little bit of insight into some of their underlying infections, some of their life concerns and how that infects, uh, affects how they uh, perceive their HIV infection and how well they can successfully manage it. So I want to thank everybody again for attendance and for our speakers. And um, I would urge you, if you have some time, uh, you can get additional information from the poster videos that are available to you on the website. And I think uh, we will see everybody in the morning and uh, look forward to day two of the meetings. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody.